We now take you to the broadcast of It's Time with Reverend Nathaniel W. Martin. Here is Reverend Martin. And if thy brother, an Hebrew man or an Hebrew woman, be sold unto thee and serve thee six years, then in the seventh year thou shalt let him or her go free from thee. And when thou sendest them out free from thee, thou shalt not let them go away empty, but thou shalt furnish them liberally out of thy floor and out of thy flock and out of thy winepress. Of that wherewith the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, thou shalt give unto them. Good evening and good afternoon and good morning, but never good night and never goodbye, because I hate goodbyes. My name is Reverend Nathaniel Wayne Martin. I'm the pastor of the New Life Institutional uh, Baptist Church here in the city of Los Angeles. We're located at 8916 South Main Street. And we'd like to give a shout out to our newest uh, graduate going from eighth grade to ninth grade, brother, little brother Rayon. And uh, we want to encourage all of our young graduates who are on their way. And we want to encourage them and let them know to keep on studying, keep on uh, hitting those books, and keep on getting those good grades. Uh, my brothers and my sisters, you and I know that we are coming out from under a severe quarantine epidemic, and uh, I trust that this uh, broadcast will find you uh, improving and doing well, holding on, surviving, thriving, <laughs> and being blessed of God here uh, in this land of uh, the living. You're welcome to come to any and all of our uh, physical services that we're having. Uh, as again, we said we're at 8916 South Main, 8916 South Main, here in the city of Los Angeles, California. And uh, we're worshiping in the building with our sister church, the uh, Shiloh Missionary Christian Church, and uh, pastor is the Reverend Dr. Della F. Holland. It's a good friend of mine. They always say when the Baptists and the Charismatics get together, there's always going to be a shouting uh, in the camp. And we certainly do thank God for the visitation of His Holy Spirit on each and every Sunday service. Amen. No, we don't wait for Him. We bring Him with us. Amen. Amen. And we glorify and praise God uh, as the children of God. As you can tell from our opening scripture, uh, I believe in reparation. I believe in it more so when I see how shabbily the poor the last three survivors of the Tulsa uh, massacre have been treated by not only the city and the county and the state of Oklahoma, but now by the entire United States of America. Uh, the they have been uh, given plaques, they've been given awards, but no money. They, they dedicate the state dedicates murals, off of which the state uh, makes millions. It's estimated, uh, according to uh, Mother Fletcher, that they that state of Oklahoma has made thirty million dollars uh, in recent years off of their suffering, but they haven't received a penny or a dollar or a dime or a check or any such thing, which stands the reason it follows the logic. If the city of uh, Greenwood was destroyed because, was because that uh, the uh, white supremacists and uh, the systemic uh, racism uh, adherents uh, wanted to get rid of them because they were thriving economically, and remember all racism in this country, uh, including uh, that ultimate, uh, the destruction of the Indian, of the so-called Indian, uh, the Iroquois, the Arawak, the first colony, the first nation that were here uh, when the uh, European began to put his foot upon the shores of this nation. He didn't find anything. He stole everything. But uh, if the uh, sentiment was that out of sight is out of mind and uh, uh, slaughtered uh, and uh, kill uh, and butcher pe uh, 
people once in the grave that tell no tale, then of course it stands to reason. That's why the people, in, the survivors of Greenwood, were never compensated for their loss, for the loss of their property, for the loss of their houses, for the loss of their businesses, uh, for the loss of their family members. The, even the insurance refused to acknowledge or to uh, honor the claims. And so that means even the death claims of the people that died were not honored uh, by the insurance companies. And believe me, those people had some life insurance policy as well as homeowner or business owner policies on those buildings because you had to have that uh, in those days because it was too uh, uncertain that it would, how things would, would uh, turn out. And of course, as we say, if they intended to uh, uh, destroy the uh, citizens of uh, Greenwood's ability to earn a living uh, or to uh, uh, thrive even in the severe economic uh, and segregated structures, strictures in which they were placed, uh, then of course it stands to reason that they would not pay them then and that they would not pay them uh, now, even though they have reached the far beyond uh, three score years and ten. Uh, Mother Viola Fletcher is 107. Uh, Mother uh, Benefort Randall is uh, 106. He's right behind her. Then uh, Brother uh, Ellis, which is the brother to sister uh, to uh, Mother uh, Fletcher. He was only six months old at the time. They've had to live this long with the last three witnesses that that actually happened, and yet they are not made whole, even in their old age, as Mother Fletcher said. Please don't let me close my eyes and don't get any type of uh, of a restitution from my my people, from my country. And that is a paradigm for how the entire uh, matter has been viewed uh, not only as a microcosm there in uh, Greenwood but as a macrocosm all over this country and you can what happened in Tulsa can be exponentially multiplied all across this nation uh, and so it is time for reparations the nation will never be whole and never get to where it would be or would have been uh, had slave had we not uh, bowed to the low-hanging evil fruit of slavery I say we because I am a citizen of the United States although my people and I myself would have been held in slavery in bondage it would have been enslaved in other words and so but as a citizen I am uh, compelled uh, to petition the, the government to make America whole so that America can go on and be uh, the bright uh, city on a hill that it well, has always uh, been reputed uh, to be. Jesus talked to us about uh, memory all through his uh, ministry. He spoke about memory, remembering what they had heard, remembering what they had learned. I study the scriptures for them in them you think to have eternal life and they are that testify of me words to that effect uh, and the like but in the upper room he stressed memory he, he stressed memory it's a wonder that you put so much uh, importance upon such a fragile uh, delicate uh, organ as as memory but Jesus placed a lot of em emphasis and a lot of importance a lot of stress upon the value of memory so if you can't remember it you better write it down because God places great value on memory uh, that's one of the worst things that happens to people who go to prison is they become uh, in that in that strange uh, netherworld of people who have been forgotten and you know slaves the, the people who were enslaved they spent their years 
not knowing if they, anybody would ever know if they lived or, or when they died or if they, if they died because a lot of them had no no headstones no no grave markers isn't that right and uh but their memory uh when others who knew them had likewise gone that way that was no no memory there's no memory there's no memory and uh there is a tradition you know that says when the last person that remembered you is gone then that means i'm sorry about this but i'm going to cut this off uh so it can't rain no more and uh but when the last person that knew you is gone then then your memory uh is subject to perish out of the earth and so uh this is the the dilemma is it not this is the uh, conundrum uh that most of us yes you even looking at me we all get uh uh absent-minded and all of that type of thing and then the other conditions uh which is the ultimate condition alzheimer's or dementia descends upon our our minds and we can't remember our own children's name our own uh wives or our own uh, husband name but yet jesus told the disciples in the upper room remember me hmm? he gave them a little simple ceremony and said use this to help you to do what remember 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 to remember to remember and we are our our memories even though our memories are not good uh, even though uh, we add to our memories but yet and still God places a great value on the 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 power or the value of memory hmm? great significance is placed all through the scripture and God gives us various aids write it upon the table of your heart write it upon these phylacteries and uh, bind it about thy hand, huh? Put it, uh, talk about it when you sit down. All types of various uh, methods that God said we should use to help us uh, maintain the right uh, uh, memories. I said all of that because we are looking as we consider uh, the value and the importance of memory, not only in its religious or biblical context, but even in its a uh, social uh context when you run up on somebody you haven't seen in a long time and you can't remember that name but you might be able to remember some of the events and experiences that uh you had a lot of times so i can see that face i just can't call that name oh uh, it's right on the tip of my tongue and uh as you grow older of course when you're young you don't have that problem when you get my age then start talking to you but uh so you see the value even more so of uh, memory. I mention all of that because we just we are in a series of holidays. Uh, we just uh, celebrated Memorial Day. We're now headed to the 19th of June, and uh, we need to uh, correct the the false narrative. Uh, going back again to the value of mem of memory. Uh, Dr. Greg Carr talks about the he has uh, six prerequisites uh, of a, a of a culture. One of them uh, being the social structure, how the society is set up, uh, how do uh, Africans see each other, how do African Americans see one another, how do I see you, how do you you see me, and then there's movement and memory, movement and memory, movement and memory who remembers the movement who remembers the cause or the purpose or the reason and then the method of the execution of that uh movement that brings about uh and restores or or, or, or develops rather a store of of memories and in dealing with the origin of what uh the power structure called Memorial Day. You remember General Logan that uh, said that the first Memorial Day uh, was in 1868. But the historians going back, Dr. David uh, Blight is his name, uh, 
in searching ran, in doing uh, archive research at Harvard, ran across an interesting newspaper article uh, that had found that had been uh, maintained. That's again, that's movement and memory, the power of memory, and that was that the first uh, Memorial Day, the first uh, Decoration Day, was not in 1868, but it was actually occurred in the month of May, and it. Uh, occurred not in Waterloo, but it occurred uh, in Charleston, South Carolina. And it wasn't the uh, uh, Confederate uh, uh, traitors who, <laughs> survivors or, or relatives and friends of those who had betrayed their uh, trust to the nation, but it was those who had been considered the least, who Saul so had the decency to uh, develop or to uh, uh, create a memorial to those who have been slain. In this case, it was at least uh, at least 250 uh, prisoners who had uh, perished, who had died in the prison there at the racetrack in Charleston, South Carolina and who had been hastily buried uh, out of sight, out of mind by the uh, Confederates who were seeking to uh, hurriedly get away and uh, from the approaching uh, Union Army and uh, who sought to hide the evidence of their crime, of their criminal enterprise, uh, the depths of it. Uh, and so there were no grave markers, but the, the former enslaved knew where those soldiers were buried. And so those so-called uh, depraved, uh, barbaric, enslaved people, those slaves whom Thomas Jefferson said uh, were uncivilized, they had enough uh, civility in them, you may say, uh, to go out and band together as the Confederates were fleeing like rats trapped in a sinking ship as they ran away. Then the, uh, the uh, informally enslaved people began uh, to celebrate in the course of their celebration of their freedom, their glad handing, their high fiving, their tears of joy uh, at their final deliverance. He said, they're brothers of ours. Because you know, a lot of uh, Negroes were in those prisons even now. They put prison Negroes in prison all the time. And uh, they said, we know where their bodies are buried. We don't know who they are, but we know that they are buried there. They're just thrown away unceremoniously. And uh, they were willing to go in and dig up those graves and get those bodies out and put those bodies in individual uh, coffins and to reinter them uh, in that uh, racetrack and that was the first beginning of the Memorial Day they not only uh, in read uh, uh, other words put the the, the remains in a, in, in a coffin and then put the coffin uh, re reinterred the coffin but they also then put up markers and then they had a, 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 a ceremony to and, and they had over 10,000 people mostly black, mostly former slaves that celebrated and, and, and performed the funeral as it were ceremony for those people. It said that uh, uh, Robert Small was there. Robert Small was the one that had stolen uh, a Confederate ship and had went and got his family and brought his family to Fort, Fortress Monroe and he had went on to fight valiantly in the Civil War, winning many battles. Uh, and uh, he uh, had still had the ship, I forget the ship's name, uh, but there he was with his ship, and on that ship he had Martin Delaney, and uh, he had one of the sons, one of the descendants of Denmark Vesey with him on the ship, going to uh, Charleston for the, to attend the ceremony for uh, those many soldiers that had been, uh, those soldiers who had been, uh, uh, who were being honored, as it were, there in the city of Charleston. 
and uh, it was quite a, a ceremony. Uh, David Blight writes uh, in his book, and uh, then if you read Dr. Wilbur uh, Jenkins' book, uh, you get further uh, elucidation. Uh, it is important that we remember our living. It is important that we remember our dead. Because the dead are not dead, they are always with us. The past is not past. As uh, William Faulkner, who is a native who was, uh, a native of Mississippi, was a great writer, wrote Tobacco Road and other, other novels. Uh, the past, the memory, are always uh, with us. And how we treat our, our loved ones, or even those we, we don't know, you know, is a reflection of a society. And as you can see, the so-called enlightened society, the civilized society, just threw the, threw the, the remains in a hastily dug grave and went their way. <clears throat> hmm? There was no ceremony. They didn't put no names on those people. And uh, they, they erected over them no tombstones, you know. Uh, they make a big deal here in the United States about the tomb of the unknown soldier. And every soldier had to have a name because he was a somebody. He or she was somebody. And that's the power and the necessity of memory. You remember when? Do you remember this? Do you remember him? Do you remember her? Do you remember the circumstances, the event, the experience? And all of those things are, are vital. Uh to our sense of selfhood because uh, even in history said he who forgets history who doesn't know history is doomed to do what? Repeat it. God help us if we repeat this uh, dismal and sorry experience we've had here in the so called land of the free and the home of the brave. Uh, the longer I live the more I agree uh, with those who say that the United States is an aspiration and we ain't got there yet and so uh, that's important uh, for us to keep aspiring because we certainly are not the United States of America uh, but think about it and not only uh, think about Memorial Day but think further uh, about uh, the 1863 Emancipation Proclamation which was uh, it's in Old Dog 30, January 1, 1863, became, uh, uh, began to come into effect. I say began because Nick's, uh, uh, Lincoln didn't sign it until around 2.30 that afternoon, 2.30, 3 o'clock that afternoon. And uh, the people in Fannyway Hall in Boston, Frederick Douglass and all of that uh, 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 galaxy of uh, abolitionist champions who have been waiting and fighting and struggling for that didn't find out about it until uh, that night and they began to celebrate they kept on celebrating we only celebrated at midnight they had to wait until way over in the next day before they found out before they got the word and what a rejoicing it was but the point was that the people in uh, Texas the slaves, the enslaved persons in Texas were not made aware of it. They were kept in the dark about the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, and they did not find out that they were free until two years later, on the 19th of June, <laughs> when uh, General Granger brought his army riding on his horse and had everybody to stop at every various plantation and gather around, and they read the Emancipation Proclamation out there in the field. And let the people know, said you is are uh, free. Uh, my 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 God, what 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 a mighty God we serve! And uh, because those pe the people who were holding them in slavery were, ha had a vested interest in keeping them as ignorant as they as they could. And there were no radio, there were no television, there were no telephones. There was certainly was no internet, internet, no email, no Instagram, none of those. Uh, instantaneous uh, message uh, uh, social social media that we have now so uh, it was much more uh, paroch parochial and and, uh, and uh, uh, they could keep the control of the uh, the news flow quite uh, uh, confidentially so that the slave owners of course knew uh, but they weren't going to tell the slaves you see what I'm saying? But my purpose in going there is to talk about the, 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 the narrative and the motion, 
movement and the memory. And so uh, on the 19th of June, slaves, got my five minute warning y'all, slaves in Texas became aware that they were free and independent citizens of uh, the uh, United States uh, of America. And so they did not celebrate, they had, were not aware in January of 1863. So in the state of Texas, they began to celebrate right there that day, playing music, dancing, jumping up and down, shouting, celebrating, uh, coming out them fields. Uh, the uh, plantation owners were just begging them to, oh, John, work here in the field with me. Don't leave my crop out there. But they said, we are free and we're going to celebrate. And uh, you know the story. Uh, but they had to develop that Juneteenth celebration regardless of uh, of the dark shadows of uh, slavery, segregation, and Jim Crow stretching his shadow of death over them uh, even then. And But that's a story for another day. The point is that they became knowledgeable that they were free or began they celebrated on Juneteenth. Uh, and you know, if you know anything about Frederick Douglass, you remember the great speech he delivered at, uh, in eight, 1852, it was, at Faneuil Hall on July 5th, not July 4th, uh, in which he asked that immortal question, a rhetorical question, uh, what to the slave is the 4th of July? And you might ask that question now, just what uh, store, do what stock, do we as black people, as we as African Americans, we as colored people have in the 4th of uh, uh, July? We have more stock in January 1 and we have more stock in Juneteenth than we have in uh, July the 4th. Although I have fought in the, uh, you have been a member of the military and have fought uh, its wars, I have also endured uh, its racism. I, I've, I've endured uh, the indignities, the insults, uh, the microaggressions, even now, of uh, endemic, systemic uh, 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 racism and all, and the uh, the prejudices of bigoted people, uh, which is ongoing. Uh, so, as I wrap up, I know uh, take stock of your memory. Uh, that's why we take pictures. <laughs> that's why. That's why we write books, huh? That's why we like to go through drawers and, and go through desks and go back through old receipts. Amen. Uh, memory is a very powerful thing. Keep up with it. And as we uh, say uh, uh, goodbye to you for this time. Oh, did I say goodbye? I never mean goodbye. Uh, we say uh, see you later for this time. We want to let you know that uh, we love you. We'll continue to pray for you. Hoping all will be yet to be well. Uh, and that you will continue to be blessed uh, by him who said, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it uh, more abundantly. Remember, I remain your good friend, your brother, Reverend Nathaniel Wayne Martin, pastor of New Life Institution of Baptist Church, and to my friends who are working on those thankless jobs. You young folk working on those jobs, they don't want to give you good, decent hours, don't want to give you good, decent pay, don't want to put you on permanent. Don't ever want to let you know what, what kind of solid shift, a permanent shift you can have so you know how to manage, manage your life. They are telling you that they do not want to pay you. And if people don't want to pay you, young man, young lady, shake the dust off your feet. Get away from there. If they don't want to pay you, don't work for them. Thank you, Doc. We're out of here. Thank you.